We ought to obey God rather than men. The Anarcho-Christian Podcast, evaluating the relationship between the Christian and the state. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Anarcho-Christian Podcast. This is episode 24, and it happens to be the first episode of 2019. So thank you for checking out this episode. If you're new to Anarcho-Christian, I'd like to just take a moment to invite you to check out our website, anarchochristian.com. There you'll also find the tab to subscribe to the podcast, and it has a couple of links on there for iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, um, pretty much anywhere where you can catch a podcast, you'll find us there. So on this episode, I'd like to go over um, a verse from Acts 5, and then also hit on a couple other things in the Bible that talk about a Christian's resistance to the state. And most of that can be summed up in Acts 5, where Peter says, we must obey God rather than men. But if you've been with me this far, you know that I'm not one to really just pick out one verse and then just take it and run with it unless we know some of the context around it. So the quote, we must obey God rather than men comes from verse 29. And I think the proper way to look at it though, would be to back up a little bit in Acts chapter five and see what it was that Peter was referencing. What was he addressing when he made that comment? So jumping right into it, the best place really is to back up to verse 12 And I'll just run through it a little bit, not necessarily read out the whole thing here. But um, verse 12 says, Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. Now, again, this is after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. And uh, the book of Acts tells the story of the apostles. And there are many miracles that are recorded in this book. And... um, Right here, we have a moment where Peter and some of the other apostles, they're doing these great signs and wonders in the public. And, uh, of course, it's not, uh, it's not really a good thing for the Sadducees in the area. And it says a little bit further down in, uh, verse 17 that the high priest took action because you had all of these people, you know, watching. Peter and the apostles. And of course it's, it's amazing. And, you know, you have all these people that are being swayed to the way to Christianity. And, um, so it says in verse 18, that the Sadducees had Peter and the apostles arrested and that they were put in the city jail. But while they were in the jail, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail during the night and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple complex and tell the people all about this life. So in obedience to this, they entered the temple complex at daybreak and began to to preach and teach. So, of course, the next morning, when the high priest and those who were with him arrived, um, they convened the Sanhedrin, which is the full senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the jail to have them brought. Well, of course, they weren't in the jail, and everyone's wondering what's going on, except, hey, someone says, look, they're out there in the temple complex teaching to the people. So the captain went with the temple police and brought them in without force because they were afraid the people might stone them. When they brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked, didn't we strictly order you not to teach In this name. And of course, they're referring to Jesus. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to bring this man's blood on us. 
But Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. So he goes on further to explain his position to the Sanhedrin. And that's where I'm going to leave off on this. I think that this small portion that I just went over, it shows the Christian's uh, position on when to disobey a law and how to disobey the law. And of course, we're talking about these same men that eventually will be put to death and they are thrown into jail over and over again through throughout the book of Acts. And we see this tension. When do we break the law? When do we not break the law? How do we break the law? How do we act? What's the Christian's way of doing this? Um, when do we do it? How do we do it? So first and foremost, when we are talking about the law, when we're talking about obeying the law, this verse is not the first one that comes up. The first one that comes up obviously is Romans 13. And I did an episode on that last year. Um, if you haven't heard it yet, I would invite you to check that out. I'll have the link to it in the show notes, but Romans 13 if you're not familiar, most people are, um, in the first seven verses, it pretty much seems like a direct message that says all Christians must obey the state no matter what. Of course, that's not what it means, but that is the way that it gets used a lot these days. And you see it used that way by politicians. You see it used that way by, uh, Christians that, um, can't think of a state outside of this sort of nationalistic American way that we have, um, where the state is always right. The state is ordained by God in this way that says everything it does is, is just and righteous and holy. Of course, that doesn't address states that are terrible, tyrannical, murderous, and it really does speak to this disconnect that we have as Americans to not second guess our state. And of course, I, I think a lot of that is uh, a product of, you know, generations of public schooling. Um, but that I guess is a topic for another day, but getting back to this Acts five twenty nine is not the first thing that pops up. But it should be something that we keep in our back pockets for addressing things like Romans 13. When someone says Romans 13, you need to obey the state no matter what. Well, we pull up Acts 5. We pull up Peter's words. We must obey God rather than men. And most Christians, even you know the, the most hard-lined uh, state-following Christian, uh, we'll usually say, well, yeah, okay. And, and the, these guys, they, for this reason, it, it's okay. But our situations in our day, we're not just going to take this literal example that the only time that you can obey God rather than men is whenever the Sadducees have you arrested for speaking in the temple. There is a more general uh, application to this and where we as Christians – do find ourselves in similar situations that the apostles did. So again, Peter takes this time to say that we have to obey God rather than men. We see that they didn't fight back. They didn't fight when they were thrown in jail the first time. They didn't fight back when they were called to the Sanhedrin the second day. And they didn't escape from jail themselves. And I think this is very important that the Christian answer to this sort of oppression and tyranny is not to fight back physically. We must always remember to be peaceful, always. And we see this moment, though, where there's this tension and we see Peter being peaceful. Now, this verse, this moment 
is not unusual. It is the church, the Christian Bible didn't start this sort of uh, counterculture movement with Jesus. This isn't a moment in history that is akin to something in the 60s in the United States where people were fed up with the government and they were fighting back. And um, that's not what's happening here. There's actually quite a rich history in our faith, which predates the birth of Jesus. And the best book I think to go back to with that would be the book of Daniel. And I think that we will see some actions by men in the book of Daniel that are very similar to the spirit of what Peter's saying here. Very true to what's in his heart when he says, we must obey God rather than men. And so I'm going to jump to the book of Daniel. It's in the Old Testament. And let's get an idea of what happens in this book. There's a couple of things that I think that we should look at. And we should also reference when accused of, you know, not obeying Romans 13 and also get a little bit of historical context behind that. So the book of Daniel takes place in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. And it starts right off with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, coming to Jerusalem and taking it over, uh, laying siege to it is the way the, the Bible puts it. It says that the Lord handed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over to Nebuchadnezzar, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. And Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. After he did this, it says that he ordered his chief of his court officials to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family. The plan was to indoctrinate them for three years in the Chaldean language and literature, and then to appoint them into the king's court. So among them was Daniel. And Daniel, it says, uh, verse 8, is determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. So he asked permission from the chief official not to defile himself. And here we have our first moment of Daniel doing something different from what the king has instructed. And it goes on further to show that, you know, he doesn't want to eat the food and the, the drink and uh, the official is a little worried that they're going to lose a lot of weight and it's going to be obvious. And um, through God's miraculous power, he these men are given just vegetables and they still don't lose any weight. They don't look uh, sickly. They don't look like they're, you know, disobeying the king here. So we get another chapter or so of some interactions with Daniel and the king. And in chapter three, it starts out that King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue, 90 feet high, nine feet wide. And we see this picture now of something that we can relate to a lot today with this, this big idol, this big representation of the king of the state is what we can usually bring this back to. But I don't want to skip over this part too quickly because I, I, I see a lot of similarities to very nationalistic things that happen in any country and in including our, our own. So I want to start in chapter three um, Verse 2, King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to assemble the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to attend the dedication of the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. So the prefects, governors, and all these men, they gathered together for the dedication ceremony. 
And they stood before the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. A herald loudly proclaimed, People of every nation and language, you are commanded, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the harp, drum, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, when all of the people heard the sound of the horn and the lyre and the harp and every kind of music, people of every nation and language fell down and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. That should draw some interesting parallels to some of our own practices. And it's not just in the United States. It's also in many countries where we have symbols that represent our democracy or, or our king or our monarchy or, or our democracy, our republic. And we have these symbols and when they are shown, there are things that we're expected to just snap to, right? We're just supposed to stand up. We're supposed to put our hands over our hearts. We're supposed to sing a song when these things happen and, it, and it's expected. And what happens when we don't do that? What happens in most cases, it's met with a lot of anger and hostility and I don't think it's just a hyperbolic thing to kind of draw these parallels and these same conclusions that when we do make these same expectations and when we just instinctively jump to it, just snap to it, and we feel that we have to, and we feel that other people have to, this is very similar. It's very similar to this idol. And this is an example that we have in the Bible that we can use today. Like I said, it looks hyperbolic sometimes, but sometimes they are this extreme. So it goes on further to talk about three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And... They see all of the bowing and worshiping of the statue, and they don't do it. They stay standing. And, of course, they're called out. Nebuchadnezzar is told that these men have ignored you, and they're not serving you. They're not worshiping the golden statue, as you as you instructed. And... Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar is furious at this point, right? And he brings the men over and he asks them, uh, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the golden statue I've set up? And gives them another chance. He says, now, if you're ready, we're going to play the music again. And, you know, we're going to start the national anthem over again. And I want you to, to, to do it. I want you to worship. And uh, they kind of cut him off before it even happens. And they say, Nebuchadnezzar. We don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar uh, is really mad now. And he has them thrown into the furnace. And, um, of course, these are three men that are thrown into the furnace. And as the story goes, uh, they're not burned. And when the men look into the furnace to see them, you know, they're supposed to be burning to death. Um, you know, of course, they, they should be, you know, in pain. And, and um, they're not. They're just standing there. But also there's a fourth figure in the fire with them. This is actually a pretty neat portion of the Bible. It's a, an event that's recorded in the Old Testament um, that's called a, a theophany. And a theophany is a pre-incarnate 
uh, Christ that appears. And uh, it happens a couple of times. Uh, Genesis 18, uh, we see this recorded and here in the book of Daniel. So taking a second to reflect on all of that, we see these men facing a moment where they are disobeying the state. They're disobeying the king. They're disobeying his law. And this is a moment where this law is asking them to obey man rather than God. And so they give a response back where they're telling Nebuchadnezzar that we're not going to do it. We're going to obey God no matter what, whether you kill us or not. So I think that this event is something that's important that we should consider uh, along with another event in the book of Daniel. This is with Daniel himself, and it takes place in chapter 6. And we have a plot against Daniel. So we have King Darius here, and he's getting together with his advisors and governors, and they come up with a plan against Daniel, and they want him to uh, come up with an ordinance and uh, that says that for 30 days, anyone who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. So, obviously he does. And uh, they say that it's irrevocable and it cannot be changed. So he signs it. Daniel hears about this document and he goes to his house, goes into the upper room with the door open, facing Jerusalem and prays, which he's always done. And he does it three times a day. But the men of that group that were plotting against him, they found him. And uh, they told the king about it. And the king answers, as a law of the Medes and the Persians, the order stands and it is irrevocable. So they grab Daniel and because he's ignored this edict and they take him to King Darius. So the king gives the order. They grab Daniel. They throw him into the lion's den. I think it's interesting at this point, too, that uh, King Darius says, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. And they roll a stone in front of the lion's den and um, he's left in there overnight. It says that King Darius doesn't sleep very well. He's kind of worried about it. Shows up the next morning and um, calls out to Daniel, um, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lion's? Then Daniel speaks. He says that um, God sent an angel to shut the lion's mouths and they haven't heard him because, and I think this is interesting, because I was found innocent before him. Also, I have not committed a crime against you, my king. So the king's actually happy about this. He didn't want Daniel to die. And um, he gave the command um that those who had maliciously accused Daniel um, were brought and they were thrown into the lion's den. And it wasn't just them. It was their whole family. And it says that uh, they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions had overpowered them and crushed all of them. So the important takeaway here is that Daniel broke the law. He went to his home, and he prayed. This is a direct violation of this law that was put into place by King Darius. And of course, you know, he is taken, arrested, thrown into the lion's den. He doesn't fight back. And um, here, God rescues him. Now, we have many times where God's people are not necessarily rescued. The, the, the apostles at some point eventually are killed, even though we have all of these stories in the book of Acts that show them being arrested and rescued or released. And we have these moments here, but I, I think that what we really do need to focus on for this part of the story or for this part of the, the topic 
is how did they act? What does a Christian do? What does someone who has faith in God for, for God's rescue, for God's providing for them, for their family, what do we do? And over and again, nonviolence is a very important part of this. Um, having faith in God. The things that we don't do are start violent revolutions. We don't curse and spit in the face of the state here. And these events from Daniel and Acts are a direct answer to those questions about what should we do? What should a Christian do? Romans 13, this and that. Go to these books, spend a little bit of time on Daniel 3 and 6 and Acts 5 and, um, you know, look at the way these men respond. Look at their countenance. And I think that it's something that all of us could remind ourselves more when the question comes up, what should we do? So I hope you liked that episode. If you're not sure exactly where to find us, uh, visit anarchochristian.com slash subscribe. And if you are enjoying this, if you've already been with us for a little while and haven't done it yet, please consider leaving a five-star rating and review on iTunes. That'll help us reach more people. That'll help us grow the show. And one other way that you can support us would be through Patreon. If you visit anarchochristian.com slash support, you'll see our link to our Patreon page where you'll see a couple of different ways that you can support us with a monthly donation. And my apologies. I think that I'm a little bit behind on my shout outs. So Nicholas and JR, thank you so much for your support because of your support and all of the patrons from last year. I'm actually recording this episode, the first episode with a new microphone. So I really appreciate it guys. And again, if anyone else is interested, you can find the support tab at anarchochristian.com. So that's it, guys. I appreciate everybody's support. Um, if you want a t-shirt, amazon.com, just look up Anarcho Christian. You'll find some really cool t-shirts there. And until next time, grace and peace. No King but Christ. Thank you for listening to the Anarcho-Christian Podcast. Subscribe to our email notifications at anarchochristian.com. Like us on facebook.com backslash anarchochristian. And follow us on Twitter at anarchoxp. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube to join us next time as we continue to evaluate the relationship between the Christian and the state. No king but Christ. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.